Hi, I'm Guillermo Verdecchia and I wrote and performed Fronteras Americanas and um, I'm going to take you through some uh, material, some images that either appear in the show or that in some way informed its creation. Well, uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, that's, this is an actual passport. That's my passport there that you can see right beside it, you know, with the crucial details. And that is my, that is my photo. Let's see. So the show is 92. So that makes me about 30 years old. So yeah, it's the late 20s, early 30s, this picture. Um, and yeah, it's a, you know, classic passport photo. I, I look highly totally reputable as most people do in their passport photos. It says place of birth. Uh, I think on your passport it's listed. And so in that one, it was a blank. I said, mm -hmm. you just leave it blank. You don't, it's not required. And um, that's the one that had uh, no mention of Buenos Aires being the place where I was born because mm -hmm. I didn't want to be, I didn't want them to, I mean, you know, if I got to the border, they could have easily looked me up, but I figured why, why flag it for them? This is probably a photograph from the first iteration of the show, and this is uh, this is me at my school desk as a seven-year-old uh, when they're doing the, the roll call. The first per, uh, performance would have been yeah at the Tarragon Extra Space there, and I'm tucked um, behind a ramp. So the the set was a kind of a, an abstraction of. Uh, a geography, if you will, but uh, so there was various pods I landed on. There was a ramp sort of center and I could tuck sort of, I could sit on the end of that or I could, as in this case, tuck myself under and, and beneath it and use it as a, as a school desk for that little moment. That was Glenn Davidson's design. Yeah, and Glenn mm -hmm. and Jim Warren and I worked on the show. We had various iterations and played across the country. And yeah, the original production is at the Tarragon. And then we went back, we were uh, invited uh, back to the Tarragon. We went from the extra space to the main space. Uh, then we played in Montreal at the Festival des Amériques. We played in Winnipeg. And as I said, each time it was essentially with the same um, creative team. And it was really nice to, as I say, continue to develop and elaborate the play with the same team of people because we shared, yeah, we shared all that understanding. We, shared, we had all that history. Yeah, so that's the dedication for the the first um, uh, edition uh, of the play, the, the 1993 edition or whatever it is, it's uh, for my parents. Um, oh, it's such a cliche, but there's a, you know, intergenerational tension. Uh, there's intercultural tension that plays out as intergenerational tension uh, because, um, you know, though I was born in Argentina uh, and felt a profound attachment to it, I grew up in an Anglo-Caucasian milieu and that exerted certain kinds of pressures on me and that shaped me in certain ways and uh, that pulled and pushed against certain things that my parents uh, felt strongly about or believed in or expected. And um, this play in some ways was, um, was a way to... Uh, I'm going to say explain myself to them, but it's more than that. It's also their story. It's it's their story of like being caught between uh, two languages and two memories and two worlds. Um, uh, yeah, that was they they got it. Unlike other things, uh, this one uh, they completely understood. Yeah. So um, so you know here we have the there's a number of things going on. There's first of all there's like I'm it's a one person show. Um, and so you don't have anybody to play with uh, when you do a one-person show other than the public. Um, so they, in a sense, become almost another figure, another character in the show. And I use the, the, the public in certain ways, or, I mean, there are two major characters in the show and they address the public in certain, in certain ways. So they have a different relationship with that public. So that it's almost like the public is being cast um, as a particular interlocutor. Um, then there's also this kind of, um, there's the text um, in the play, which is another, uh, if you will, not quite an interlocutor, but another layer of uh, discourse in the play. So the text might say one thing and I might be doing or saying something else and it's the audience that has to kind of work to stitch together something from what the text is saying to what I'm talking about or to interrelate those or to add them up to make to make meaning out of that. 
So there's that going on. Um, there's a there's obviously you know a satirical sense uh, to the show. That's that uh, you know that image of that bandito obviously is uh, you know. It's also a kind of, uh, if you will, bouffon, that kind of grotesque clown, that kind of mockery playing with, um, with archetypes, with images, and perhaps playing in territory um, that is dangerous in some ways. And this is a game I love to play on stage, which is to kind of um, get the audience to laugh at something and then metaphorically slap them in the face and say, what are you laughing about? That's not funny and then make them laugh again. And simultaneously to implicate myself in that game because uh, I never wanted to stand up on stage and go, um, audience, you're horrible and wrong and you're totally racist about this and that and uh, I have all the answers. It's far more interesting to say, here's a situation that's complicated and kind of messy and where things maybe have gone wrong and look how I have contributed to it. Look how I'm a part of it. So always seeking to kind of implicate myself in the questions or the problems I'm raising and the performance tries to do that. The play is called, you know, American Borders. It's about crossing borders. One of the borders it crosses is the pros, is the proscenium, right? There's this direct address to the audience and a certain kind of decorum with the audience, right? To kind of, again, metaphorically smack them around a bit uh, and yet make them try and charm them at the same time. So Wide Load is, is, you know, yet again, he's a variation. So he appears first in disguise as this, you know, Frito Bandito kind of um, ridiculous uh, figure from, uh, from Westerns, this, you know, Mexican Bandito with a hump and he's really dusty. Every time he moves, there's a cloud of dust that goes off. And uh, Wide Load, that, 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 that thing he appears in is very much kind of Frito Bandito, but also, you know, right out of, because the Frito Bandito was like a, you know, a chip salesman, right? Yeah. I, I, I am the Frito Bandito. He was a little cartoon, but it's right out of the Mexican, those, those, those Westerns, which, you know, I used to kind of love watching them because they had people who spoke Spanish in them. And even though I'm not Mexican um, and Argentinians and Mexicans are quite different in many, many ways. As a kid, it was like, oh, there's something there. There's something like us there. But like they were all sleepy, they were all useless, they were always scared, and it was always you know, or they were and they were dirty. They they never washed their hair. Um, they and it was always the gringos who had to come and save them, or you know, show them how to whatever. Um, so that to me is also the Frida Bandido. It's, it's this image of the you know uh, sleepy, useless Mexican. Uh, peasant who has to be rescued by the heroic um, white cowboy from the States. Um, so to me that, you know, the Frito Bandito <laughs> encompasses all of that and very much the guy that Wide Load appears as um, is, a, is a take on that, you know. And he peels that off and he goes, you know, it's just a joke, it's a Halloween costume. And underneath he's this other guy, he's this Pachuco. And he in a way is an homage to the Pachuco in um, the, uh, the, from the play Zoot Suit by Luis Valdez. Um, and so this is in a way, you know, uh, perhaps not so familiar a figure in Canada, but in certain parts of the US, uh, you know, the Pachuco as a kind of, um, shall we say superhero figure or mythical figure or historical figure from a Latinx culture is, isn't, isn't that, um, is quite familiar. Um, but I wanted to kind of nod to Valdez's uh, play and that character who is so vital and so interesting and so exciting and so theatrical. I kind of want to nod to that, steal it in a way and use it for my own purposes. And it's precisely to play that game of kind of appearing to inhabit a, a, a stereotype uh, or a kind of icon uh, that you think you know, but then subverting it. So wide load, you know, uh, he has an analysis, he has a politic, he has a history, he has a serious education. And what he does is, is a classic kind of post-colonial gesture of reversing the gaze, of making the audience the subject or object of our inquiry.
going, oh, you people, you're so interesting, you white people, you Anglo folks, like you're so exotic in this way and that way and that way. And it just exactly flips that on its head. And that's part of the game of the play. Is, is Antonio Banderas conscious of what he's doing here in this photograph or is he just kind of naturally sexy in this particular way like I don't I just can't understand it I wouldn't be able to do that without laughing my head off like first of all I, you know I don't look like him or never did but you know this kind of glowering kind of just hunky kind of steamy thing that these guys do is like is it are they acting or is it really them and there's Javi Bardem, who's also kind of gorgeous and a fantastic actor. And I mean, all of these people were so brilliant. Um, there's Douglas Fairbanks as uh, the Gaucho. It's a really early film. It's an absolutely unbelievable performance. Um, the, the, his charisma, his energy, his physicality, um, he's amazing. Um, and at the same time, he's to he's totally inside this cliched image of this of this Latin lover, and um, and there's Gael Garcia Bernal. You know, there's a a variation on that, kind of just a little simpler. Gilbert Roland, again, what a stylish guy! What a great what a great look. I find all these people kind of they're all kind of gorgeous. They're all kind of thrilling, but they're also they've got this kind of theatricality to them that I also really like they're fully inside this image of themselves or this image of of the Latin lover. They're just completely inside it. Mm. Um, and there's something about that that I find really, really funny and really kind of thrilling. I love Zorro, so I don't know that Zorro was a Latin lover, but, uh, you know, there's something romantic about him. Uh, you know, uh, he's a hero who defends the underclass and uh, he wasn't a bad looking guy, you know, when you got his mask off and stuff. Um, I wouldn't say that when I was growing up, the Latin lover was like a, was like a, a force or an influence on my psyche, um, but it becomes one slightly later on when you when you realize the the image repertoire that Latinx people uh, inhabit in uh, in North American popular culture, and this is one of the things they're allowed to do or expected to be is kind of sexy, uh, yeah, hot, good looking. Um, and of course, this applies to all sorts of people, to all sorts of uh, racialized people. You know, there are certain positions that they are encouraged to inhabit or um, allowed to or expected to. And uh, in our case, it's this. And of course, like any one of these um, cliches, uh, it's a problem because it's limiting. And when you don't live up to it, you feel uh, at the same time really annoyed that you're supposed to live up to it and uh, extra annoyed privately that you don't. Like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I dance the tango? Or, you know, why can't I glower um, kind of broodingly and sexily like, um, like what's his face? This is this image is one of my weird paintings that um, uh, <laughs> that I was making. Uh, you know, painting is uh, I'm really stretching the term to to include this, but it's a thing I made that I showed uh, to my therapist. Uh, or let's say that it's a picture that appeared in the play when I said I showed my therapist these paintings I had made. And I just let the image sit there and you could decide for yourself, like if this was something I had genuinely made uh, when I was, um, you know, in my private time, or is this a thing I have made for the show? Did I really see a therapist? What does this reflect about me? Because again, the other thing I'm playing with in the show, it is a play after all, right? It's a play. It's an opportunity to put all these aspects of my life, real, invented, dreamt, uh, heard of, read about, um, imagined, put them all together to try and make some meaning, to try and understand um, what they mean, what, what the relationship is between lived experience and, 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 and felt experienced or imagined and so you know images like this are a, a way to try and get at 
things that are very difficult to say or that maybe can't be said, that this image in a way does its own work. In, much, in some ways, like the following image of the heart, um, which is, by a, is from a Mexican artist that I, I, I admire very much, uh, Naum Zenil, and that is, um, it's cropped, but uh, he's, all, he's forever drawing these anatomically correct hearts uh, in, his, in his, he's got them in his paintings. And this heart is sur sort of surrounded by a crown of, of, of thorns. And it's just, a, for me, a really super evocative image that connects to the, the weird moments in the play when Verdecchia goes to the doctor and says, you know, basically, what's wrong with me? Find the thing in me that is full of sorrow and get rid of it. Um, find the thing in me that feels connected to these things that I can't possibly have a connection to, cut them out. And this painting by Nahum Zenil and this weird thing of mine, they point in some way for me to those, to those feelings, to those things going on in our heads and in our hearts or souls that um, are so difficult to name. So yeah, maps, I mean, I just, I just love, I love maps. Maps are these fascinating attempts to, uh, to render the world, <laughs> three dimensionality, all this complexity uh, in two dimensions. And I, I love old maps. I find them so evocative, you know, with drawings of the weird creatures you're gonna encounter in Patagonia and of, uh, you know, mythical things or things that no longer exist. Uh, I find them super evocative. And that's why this next image when I first saw this work, I, it so blew me away. This, these are paintings by an Argentinian artist called Guillermo Cuitca. And what he's done is he's painted maps on mattresses. And these are little mattresses, if I recall them. They're like child-size mattresses. And all over the surface of the, of the mattress, he's painted these very, very complex uh, road maps. Uh, or geographical maps. And I, when I saw this for the first time, I just, it just blew my mind because I felt like, oh my God, that's the bed I've been sleeping on all my life in some way. Like, where am I? Um, and it's so, you know, it's, it's the space I sleep in, the space I dream in, the trying to map my place in the world, trying to make it real, trying to document it, trying to prove it somehow, trying to nail it down. And um, this, this image, I mean, this doesn't appear in the play, but this was, this was strong in my, um, in my mind when I was at work on the play. You know, this is my, the play is my version of this in some, in some way. And then there's, of course, the famous um, Torres uh, painting of uh, Latin America upside down here, you know, this, in, this inversion of, of the world. Maps reflect all kinds of biases, right? Torres Garcia turns the uh, typical depiction of the world uh, on its head and says, no, we're not, we're not down below, we're not upside down, we're, we're this way and reorients us. And that again, of course, is part of what Fronteras Americanas and lots of plays like it are trying to do. Yes, this image of, oh, it's an extraordinary image, right? A road, a uh, highway sign telling drivers to be careful because people are fleeing because they're crossing the road. It's a, a you know, little nuclear family the mother and father and mom has this child by the hand because this is um, a highway near the Mexican border in the States. And um, again, this doesn't appear in the show, but you know, it's easy to romanticize migration. You know, if we think of migration as cosmopolitanism and as of, you know, being a citizen of the world and so on, but uh, migration, you know, so often is forced and terribly, terribly perilous. And, you know, this is an old photograph. Um, but we, you know, we are, we are reminded, we were reminded very, very recently of how uh, present 
how immediate, how today this problem is, right? Uh, there are still people trying to get into the States, trying to get into North America, you know, coming from Guatemala, coming from Honduras, trying to get into Mexico, trying to get through Mexico. Uh, and we've heard the horror stories. Um, so this was kind of a, a cautionary note for me not to not to romanticize displacement and um, and migration. All of these, all of these, I mean, there's lots of this kind of thing, but what I liked here is this kind of, you know, taking something the traditional image of, you know, uh, of the Virgin of Guadalupe or um, and and reworking her for different purposes um, for um, there's another Naum Senil painting on there. There he is again. Um, he also always paints himself in his paintings. Uh, he always appears in his paintings, almost always. Um, but even here, he's, he's reworking this kind of iconography of the Virgin. Um, and he's also working with old, with uh, retablo paintings and ex voto paintings, these kind of naive, if you will, devotional images. Um, so these artists are all reworking this kind of traditional material. Um, and, and, and making something now, making something new, making something that's, uh, that's of the culture in the moment, uh, whether they happen to be Chicano or whether they happen to be Mexican or whether they're Argentinian, whatever. Um, and that's sort of what I felt I was up to in a way. I'm not really reworking traditional materials, but I am bringing different things together uh, in a kind of syncretic manner to try and express a particular uh, immediate current uh, moment. So these were, this is all kind of fodder for, for, for me, for my brain. These are also images that in some way, you know, kick around in my psyche. Um, you know, as a, somebody who grew up nominally Catholic, um, who went to church when he was little, um, these images of the Virgin are in there somewhere. And so they remain, they, they, they still have a kind of power, um, even though I don't necessarily believe there's something about these icons that, um, that are at work on me. Um, and I guess it's a way of re-embracing these things because I rejected that for a long time, simply because I you know, wasn't crazy about the church. Um, but the, I had to recognize all oh, these images are in your psyche somewhere and um, you can, you can let them back in. You can you can enjoy them. And these artists are allowing me to appreciate them in new ways. Right. So this is a handful of photographs from um, that afternoon in Santiago. I have many, 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 many more. Um, so I've just kind of thrown in a handful here. Um, and well, there's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, you can see the size of the crowd that is gathered. You can see the number of police officers, like how many cops, how many different kinds of cops are gathered around this body. And that was the other thing about Chile at the time. Well, it's not unlike a lot in the world actually, but I mean, there's a, there, are, there were a lot of cops kicking around in Chile when I was there. And this was just after Pinochet. Um, so there's motorcycle cops, there's plainclothes cops, there's guys who look, I don't know what they look like. There's other guys in kind of quasi-military uniform. Um, and, and as I said, um, this guy, this man died on the street. He, um, he stopped moving. Uh, I saw him die there. Uh, and, you know, as no ambulance was ever called. Um, and, um, yeah, this is the record of that moment. These are images that in the play we see in the second act. So in the first act, I you know tell the story of getting to Santiago and finding this hotel and um, falling asleep and then hearing these shots or hearing this noise outside the street and going to the window and and seeing this below me and taking the photographs. And I narrate that in the first act. And in the second act, we actually see these photographs when I say I went back to Santiago and looked for some sign of the man who had been shot on the first day of my return. And I quote a little bit of that beautiful poem by uh, Lorca. 
It's a poem about the death of his bullfighter friend. And he says, que no quiero verla. I don't want to see it. Um, and, and he says, you know, it was five. It was five in the afternoon. Um, you know, a child brought the white sheet. Um, I don't want to see it. Tell the jasmines, the, you know, tell the white jasmines, tell the tiny white jasmines I don't want to see it, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and these images appear at that point. The focus is on, in the first section, it is on me. It's like, what am I doing exactly? What am I doing? I'm taking photographs of this. Why am I taking photographs of this? I mean, and this terrible suspicion that there's some, on my part, some wish or desire to see something like this, to engage in some way with the terrible history of Latin America that uh, I was fortunate enough to mostly leave behind. Um, and then, you know, in the second act, when they, when they return, it's also, you know, it's up against that Lorca text, which keeps insisting, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. And yet, um, it's, it's not something you can turn off. Um, there they are. And um, yeah, I mean, it, they, they, the pictures do function as a kind of evidence, but I didn't want them to simply double, you know, or um, um, to, to be a kind of simple mirroring of what I was saying. Here I am talking about this thing, here's the picture. Uh, I wanted to create a, hopefully a, a bit more complexity to it and to leave it open in some, uh, you know, to, uh, to try and leave things open for interpretation. Uh, as much as possible. So that's why they sit there that way in Act 2 without explanation. Hopefully we're making connections back to we heard, what we heard in Act 1. Um, let us compare mythologies, right? Isn't that, that's the Colin line, right? And um, so, that, I mean, the play, is all, the play is doing this in a, in a, in a number of ways, um, it's, uh, you know, it. I, I am deliberately playing with this question of of Northrop Frye's. You know, uh, the quintessential question for Canadians is not "Who am I?" but "Where is here?" Uh, well, here is where we are, <laughs> and let's draw. Let's let's uh, drawing on another uh, great Canadian, um, Leonard Cohen. Let us compare not mythologies, but let's compare our geographies. Let's compare where we sit in the world and how we locate ourselves. And part of the project of Fronteras Americanas is to say, Latin America isn't, it's not 10,000 kilometers away. It's, it's, it's just, if you turn the right corner downtown, you're there, right? Um, that that the border is a much more complex uh, space than this simple kind of cartographic uh, line that we draw, right? This, uh, the border is, is um, it's, it's dispersed in some ways and it's fractured and it's fragmented and it's all over the place. And there are countless borders, right? This, yeah, I'm not at the crossroads. It's a beautiful little poem, tiny, tiny poem by the Mexican Nobel Prize winner, Octavio Paz. Um, in Spanish, it's No estoy en el crucero, elegir es equivocarse. I'm not at the crossroads. To choose is to go wrong. And that's, to me, it was like, right. I mean, I, um, right. I don't have to choose. That's the thing. Um, this is the wonderful thing about syncretism, about hybridity, um, and uh, about postmodernism. In lots of ways, is, is we don't we don't necessarily have to choose. It's not either or. It's yes and. It's both and. Right? I can be both. I can be in two poles. I can be in between. And for the longest time in my life, I felt like I had to choose: um, Are you this or are you that? And always felt like I was failing, no matter what I chose. But in fact, we can choose to live in between these things, and lots of people do. And this, to me, is the is that for me was the great is the thing I, I learned. I, I said I started to write Fronteras Americanas to figure out where I lived, um, because you know physically I reckon I physically <laughs> here I am in Canada, but um, my imagination, my lots of my being was caught up with Latin America, with Argentina. Um, and so I felt this tension and 
writing Fronteras Americanas revealed to me that I can live in between these places and performing Fronteras uh, for years and um, not just in Canada has revealed to me that of course I'm not the only person doing this and that, that this is still a meaningful kind of, um, that the border is still a really meaningful place for lots of people. Um, I read from the play in Germany many, many years ago, not that long ago, I don't know, a decade ago or so. And I was always, you know, I was amazed that people would come up and say, but this is like my story. I'm a, I'm, we're, my family's Turkish and here we are in Germany. And I was like, oh yeah, of course, right. You're, you're in between these worlds too. It's a completely different sense. Your, your experience is very, very different than mine, but this metaphor and this fundamental experience of being caught between two cultures, memories, tongues, also applies. This is this is uh, this is an uh, I think the position that you know countless people around the globe inhabit, and in in also in much more than just a binary sense or of two 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 poles. You know, some people are navigating, you know, a lot more than that. This is um, this is one challenging difficult but also i think really promising because if we can inhabit these in between spaces i mean the border is the place where people meet the border is the place where ideas cross and encounter um the border is a productive space or it can be if we stop uh policing it and securitizing it and you know shutting it down and, and anyway, you can't shut a border down. The moment, the moment you, you, you do that, it's, it's such a kind of force, a psychic force is built up at that border that it breaks. And, and things, things, things atrophy when you close the walls in that way. the tarragon audiences in 1993 where they were up for it they were like great bring it on this show oh i get it there's 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 not going to be a story in the conventional sense of you know this happens then this happens and therefore there's some problem to be resolved and there's a climax and uh, blah, blah, blah. right we're going on a trip with this guy and it's partly meditative and it's partly you know discursive and it's partly satirical and it's partly this and they were willing to roll with it 